So my name is Spencer Branson. I'm a city planner in the city of Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, and this is basically just a presentation on the modeling efforts that uh, we've embarked on and the, um, the workflows that we're using for models and kind of uh, what the outcomes, uh, we're trying to get different outcomes um, in a vast array of different um, areas. So we'll just be going over all of those. So a background again, this is kind of the municipality perspective. So a lot of people um, at the SketchUp Base Camp are more, uh, you know, architects or uh, you know, consultants of various types. Um, so this this is kind of the lens of um, a municipality that a lot of people will actually be developing in or interacting in. So uh, just a little bit about Fort Collins, the the city, town, city that. Uh, I'm in. It's uh, one of the tweener situations where it's it's a population of about uh, just over 150,000 right now. Uh, we're growing very rapidly. We actually have um, one of the lowest vacancy rates in the nation right now, and that poses its own sets of issues. It's kind of how do you manage that success? Uh, so that's that's what we're dealing with right now. Here's a shot, uh, an image of our downtown. Uh, you can see most of it's pretty low slung. A lot of it's, you know, two to four stories. As you can see there's, you know, a couple of towers and some larger buildings. We're definitely seeing patterns uh, in this day and age of larger development, larger infill projects wanting to come in. And so a lot of what we're trying to do is reconcile how we have this increased density in uh, um, larger buildings and um, more building stock coming in. And how does that be compatible with, with what we currently have? So. Um, we do see a lot of buildings now that are um, this kind of modern style, and there's nothing wrong with it. The one thing I do want to say about it is uh, a lot of these buildings kind of want to act as their own focal point. They, a lot of buildings these days draw attention to themselves uh, with if it's bright colors, and there's nothing against this building. Um, bright colors, um, different textures, there's sometimes a lot going on. Um, we're looking at uh, how to you know, have buildings like this, but then also try to uh, really have buildings that kind of act as this like edge and pattern defining building. So it's not necessarily jumping out in the same way with all the bright splashy colors, but still performs um, a vital function of just creating a, a unified um, uh, cityscape. And so a lot of that is what we've been looking at for, for the process. So, to start the modeling process, what it happened through uh, a long-range planning effort. Uh, it was the downtown plan, and so this is—it's actually an ongoing plan right now. It's uh, about a total of two-year uh, process for um, outreach and actually crafting the plan. It covers a lot of topics, but we've actually used this model throughout the process uh, to do all sorts of outreach and analysis, um, and that's. That's kind of how we started building it. So this is the complete model right here. Um, I know it's like really hard to see uh, any detail, but it's about a mile uh, in either direction. It contains a couple hundred buildings. Uh, it's photorealistic, and so basically we can uh, analyze things either aerially if we need to, but what we really try to focus on is like the ground level user experience, and so that's how we built the model. Is um, with that in mind is where we can analyze it at a photorealistic level uh, from the pedestrian experience. So, so some objectives here. Uh, first of all, just like how do you actually wrap your head around making a, a model this big? So how do we make a daunting process a little bit more manageable? I'm just going to go through some workflow tips for uh, the modeling process that we use. And um, by no means is that the only way to do things. Uh, and then Kind of the more interesting stuff we're going to get into is how do you actually maximize the potential of a model? So you've spent all this effort creating, you know, some large intricate model. Uh, how do you really utilize it at, in as many ways as possible and get the, the most mileage out of that model? So um, starting off here. So the very first thing, and I can't stress this enough, uh, it might seem really simple or obvious, but it's just to articulate your goals. And so uh, if you make a model of this size or even smaller ones, uh, it's really important to make sure, um, you know, if it's clients or stakeholders or community members or just people internal to your team, 
making sure that you're going to actually sync up kind of your vision for how this model will get built and how it will perform. And so um, you want this to be a process that isn't rigid at the same time. And so uh, you start out and you have this vision, but hopefully that vision will grow and evolve and expand over time uh, with the modeling process. I'm going to just go in real quickly to the targeted outcomes that we currently have as the city for using our model and kind of the stuff we're trying to get out of it. So the first thing is start to provide strategies and clarity for building compatibility, context, and adjacency. And so basically what that is is if you have an infill building, so you've got a project that's coming in to your downtown or to a site, how do you analyze that and make it as compatible as possible uh, with its surrounding condition while still having it be a unique project? And so what we'll probably be doing with all of this, it's looking like, is uh, actually crafting a new code. It'll probably be a form-based code. Um, if you've ever heard of that, it's basically um, guidelines and um, uh, structures for how to actually um, uh, develop and, and have um, a compatible project. So we're working on that currently. We're also looking at what are appropriate step backs for buildings. And so what a step back is, is if you have a vertical plane of a building, this happens a lot, especially with larger buildings, uh, it's stepping back some of the mass at upper levels so it articulates the building a little bit more and that's just a way to actually um, mitigate the size or impact of a building. And so we're finding out that there's, if you set some sort of regulation on what a step back would be, uh, it's, it makes a really big, um, sometimes a challenge for developers where uh, sometimes the step back that cities mandate aren't actually structurally efficient and so it, it actually costs more uh, for projects to do that. So we're making sure that from both a structural and um, an aesthetic, like a pedestrian or user experience, that that step back makes the most sense in a building. One of the large things, I'm gonna get more into this later, is gaining clarity for the impacts of providing on-site parking. And so a couple of years ago, the city of Fort Collins mandated, uh, we have a new um, minimum parking requirement in the downtown. And we're actually seeing impacts with projects for um, what they can do and how they can develop sites based on that parking. And uh, we're finding out that it's actually pretty restrictive. So we're re-examining that. We're also trying to make our land use code, which is basically this gigantic, huge book on the way you can develop in our city. We're trying to make it more predictable for developers. So if a developer's coming in from uh, an outside community or um, another area, they can uh, actually look at the land use code and have a clearer idea of what they can or cannot develop in our community. We're also trying to just use this model to analyze uh, methods to increase affordability. And so this is um, things such as um, we're doing models that are looking at micro units. So how can you have a project that uh, maybe has a smaller unit size, which is then more affordable in theory. Uh, and so it's more of a fine scale detail, but um, we're doing that analysis ourselves as a city to potentially provide incentives or, or other methods for getting that type of housing uh, in, in the community. And then just trying to actually paint the pictures of what are the trade-offs intrinsic to development. And so if you mandate someone to, to have um, some ground level open space or um, more interesting massing or higher level or higher quality of materials, what are the impacts that that, that actually has on the development and, and how can we really try to work to, to balance all of these things and get the best um, projects possible? So the first like big thing after you've kind of articulated your goals is to actually get a team together to uh, create a model. And so there's people that do the heavy lifting. So like for the city of Fort Collins, uh, I did pretty much all of the modeling. I had a little bit of intern help, but um, it's not just the people actually creating the model, but making sure you have the correct stakeholders, the correct consultants, uh, make sure that you have um, buy-in from all of these different people to actually like go forth and, and create a model. Just kind of like articulating your goals, mapping your process will be extremely beneficial. And so this can be as general or complex as, as you want, but 
uh, basically syncing everyone up to be on the same page about how you're actually going to create a large scale model like this. Um, so starting off with basically the how are like what is this model trying to fulfill in our community? Why why are we doing this? How is it going to be used? All the way down to the workflow and process, um, and then even to outcomes. So then hopefully within that process, you have the ability to keep it flexible. And so one of my favorite things about SketchUp is just the inherent flexibility in the program. And so if I have this master model that has all these images, photorealistic images, if I want to go ahead and do some sort of other massing study or something, it's as easy as just doing a save as. Um, and then you can strip all of those textures and, and do something completely different. Um, also, I, I take from our big model, I take little pieces of it. I'll just cut out a little section and do studies. Um, keeping it flexible also means being able to render it or uh, portray it in different ways. And so you don't want to box yourself in uh, whenever possible when, when you're doing something that takes this much time and effort. Kind of touched on already, already, especially with staff, but inventorying your resources. So who do you have that could actually create this model? What's their expertise? Are there knowledge gaps? Are there ways that you can uh, utilize things like um, interns? You can tap universities for resources. So if there's an architecture or maybe a landscape architecture firm at a local university, can you maybe bring some of those students on board to help out with the process? And then data is also really driving the process. So you're really only as good as your data is for uh, how you're modeling this. And so I'm going to get into that and what we did um, in a little bit more detail here in a minute, but um, you really need to make sure you know what data you have moving forward. If there's gaps with that data, how much will it cost to get the data if you need it? Or what's another workaround or method that you can approach the problem without um, you know, going through some crazy effort to get uh, whatever data you need? So it does come down to this balance and prioritizing um, all of your, your resources um, at hand. And so I think of it as little sliders here. And so if you just one slider, so the cost, you know, um, if you have a huge budget, you can do things very quickly. You can do things accurately, all of that stuff. Um, if you have, you know, a ton of time, maybe you can do things for cheaper. That's kind of what we did with the city. We did this model over, um, you know, it was probably five or six months. Um, so actually for us, the cost was, uh, basically just staff time, paying, paying um, primarily my salary. Um, and beyond that, we just, we, we, we did it over a longer period of time. Um, and then you've got scoping accuracy in there. So what is the actual scope that you're doing? So for us, it was the entire downtown area. Um, you wanna make sure you're, you're scoping it correctly where uh, you get everything you need and nothing you don't. Um, and then the accuracy component is pretty interesting because no matter how crazy the technology gets these days, there's still going to be some level of inaccuracy in a model. And you need to just really uh, have a clear understanding of where inaccuracy would be appropriate or where you really, really need to ratchet down and try to be as precise as possible with your model. And that will vary for everyone, so just, just keep an eye to it. So the acronym that just happened to like pop out with all of this um, is CATS, and the, the way I, it really does help me think about all of this. Um, with all of these inputs and resources, it's like having, you know, a cat or cats. And so if you have a single cat, and it's just a pet, and it's in your house, um, you can go on vacation, it's not a big deal, very little upkeep. Um, you can go to SketchUp Basecamp and just leave your cat, and it's fine. Um, it turns into a whole different situation if you have 45 cats. So you've got 45 cats running around your house, you're gonna need like different feeding regimes like litter box maintenance, um, conflict resolution between cats, all of this stuff becomes more of an issue. So it's this kind of ballooning thing that happens uh, with a model. So it's, it's more file management and organization that needs to happen. It's potentially um, a bigger computer, um, a, a bigger, beefier graphics card. And so, um, yeah, when you're scoping your model, think about cats. So you can go big or not. A model of a city that can be used for analysis or visualization. Um, 
Sometimes it's good to have this huge model and you can do all these different things with it and it covers a wide area. Sometimes it just doesn't even matter. For a lot of situations, especially uh, like for the architecture firms and people out there, uh, it's, it's going to be just fine to have um, a smaller study. And so, so you don't need to go bigger than, um, than the relevancy of the project or situation you're working on. Unless you want bragging rights to your friends, which that's nerdy. Um, so just a couple tips here just for file management that really uh, helped us with our process. The first thing, and I will talk about imagery on buildings here in a minute, but uh, the first thing here is just to resize all of your images and if you're using it in Arial, um, resize those down to the smallest acceptable size for yourself or for your situation. And so for us, uh, we used a high resolution Arial image uh, and we really, we really prioritized having that be a large really clean, good looking file. Uh, so to us, that was really important. So our aerial image was um, fairly large, as relatively speaking, as was uh, the, the images we put on buildings. I think um, usually about the largest pixel dimension we'd use for a face of a building with an image is about a thousand pixels. I know that's a little technical detail. We'll get into it more in a minute, but um, Try it out for yourself. See, you know, do some test renders with a building or something. Uh, you can always scale it up um, to the, the whole model, but see what size of images uh, really works for, for your purposes. Um, you're also going to want to group and save all buildings separately from a master file. I'm going to get into this more later, but basically what it is is you've got your master file and then every building in it is saved out as its own SketchUp file. So it makes it a lot easier to work within that uh, and just keeps it a little bit cleaner and a little bit more efficient. Um, everyone in SketchUp has their own philosophies, but use some sort of method to sort layers and elements in your model appropriately. And so this is for organizations, so your model uh, runs uh, cleaner, so maybe you don't need all that information on at one time. Uh, it can also be for visualization purposes. Um, and then also when you're modeling, this is always the case with any model, just try to minimize the complexity of your polygons or your images or um, any way you can kind of clean up and streamline a model. Just keep an eye to that. So um, nice, simple polygons always um, do the trick. So now we're going to get into some workflow ideas. Uh, again, we've got this little graphic here. Need to stress, there's no single right workflow for any of this. You need to find a solution that really works with your situation. Um, but so there's an infinite uh, number of workflows that um, will get the job done. So that it all goes back up to kind of what I was talking about before, where you're inventorying your resources and your staff time and your budget and mix all that stuff together. And, and hopefully you can come up with a workflow that, that makes sense for, for your project. So that whole inventorying data uh, slide I had earlier, this is the data that we primarily used for our model. So first we have, like I mentioned, that uh, this is just a little snippet of that uh, high resolution aerial imagery. Technically this, it's a kind of jargony term, but it's uh, orthographically correct and it doesn't really look like it here. Orthographically correct basically means that um, it's, it's accurate, it's not distorted. Um, and so that does make a difference, you know, if you're using some other type of aerial imagery, just know that there could actually be some distortion in there that you need to be aware of. Um, we used a building footprints layer. We didn't actually use that in our SketchUp model, but the way I used it was to reference what I have up here, which is LiDAR height attribute data. And what that is, is basically a plane with lasers. It sounds super futuristic. This like laser shooting plane is flying overhead and it's collecting data. And part of that data that's collecting is actually the height attribute for those buildings. So our super nifty GIS team that we have working for the city went ahead and um, put that little um, attribute onto the building footprints layer so I could just click on a building and I know how tall it was. And we did stuff like this. You probably want to cross check a little bit. So um, we actually went and found like um, development review files um, and cross-check just to make sure that information was accurate. The other thing you can just do is get pretty good at counting stories and you can generally know um, what a commercial story uh, is a lot of times or a residential story and you can just manually go, go out and get that information yourself. Again, it's all part of your process. And then the other thing we used, we kind of leaned on a good amount, it was Google Earth. 
And I'm going to go on a little tangent here because I do get this question a good amount. And a lot of people uh, just ask, it's like, why did you actually create this whole model? Like Google Earth actually is pretty good these days. Um, at first, when they were rolling out this new technology of, it was something similar to LiDAR where they were able to just automatically generate 3D forms. Um, at first, it looked like the apocalypse and all the buildings were melting and the trees um, were like these like cobweb scary things. Um, now, it actually looks pretty good. Like, definitely have to give Google Earth credit. Um, the buildings look pretty pretty normal. And but the the thing is with Google Earth is you can't get you can't blow it up to this massive size like we can do with our model. We're dropping in different buildings. We're cutting sections. Uh, we're overlaying different pieces of information. And so, uh, you know, it's basically like. You know, it's it's got ten times the functionality now that just Google Earth has. So, uh, but we did use Google Earth um, to help model the building. So, uh, looking at things like how far things were stepped back or inset, um, what are, what's some sort of uh, roof detail or cornice detail on a building, we were able to reference that to help us uh, model uh, on on our end in SketchUp. So, that was our data. When analyzing what workflow to, that would be best for us, we looked into these three things. Uh, I'll just run through them. I don't have images of the first two, primarily for like copyright images. I'd probably get like sued or arrested if I showed you images from someone else. But um, pictometry, it's a very similar thing where you have an airplane flying over that's shooting out lasers. It's actually, sorry, pictometry is more of um. Uh, I think it's actually just photos that it's taking, and it takes them from um, a bunch of different angles, and it's at this very specific, um, a bunch of different vantage points, and it's at a very specific angle. It's like 30 or 45 degrees, and uh, very smart people have developed ways to um, basically use algorithms to stitch them all together to create 3D models from that imagery. And so you can either have pictometry that's just building masses, or you can have pictometry that's uh, photo skinned buildings. And so the thing that we saw, and this technology might be, while we're in this room talking right now, it's probably being refined and developed. But um, the thing we found with the imagery on the buildings was they're taking from an aircraft. And like I said earlier in the presentation, we were really looking for that, um, that ground level user experience. And so it wasn't really the exact imagery that we wanted on those buildings. So. So we kind of we went in a different direction. There's also a cost involved with it. Um, I'm not going to throw out numbers because uh, they'll, they'll be wrong. But um, uh, it does cost money, and, and so a, a, a decent amount. So you have to think about that. Procedural modeling, um, the like really big, exciting, up and coming program I've seen for procedural modeling is called City Engine. And so what procedural modeling is is, is basically using um, it's more like code language, and it turns into like basically using sliders to make a building and make a building geometry. The thing is with procedural modeling is it's really good at um, making a representative building that you want. Um, so maybe you want a four-story four commercial building. It'll make that building, but it's not good at modeling existing conditions. And that's why we again steered away from it is if you have this huge... Um, undeveloped field, this huge swath of land, and you want to show um, clients or the city what it could look like with different modeling scenarios, maybe that procedural modeling would, would make sense for you. Um, and then what we did is, um, I'm calling it hand modeling. Like It sounds ridiculous to have 3D modeling be called hand modeling in this day and age, but um, we basically just went out and took images, extruded buildings, did all the massing ourselves, and basically just just did it uh, uh, manually, I guess you could say. Um, the thing about all three of these, uh, and even the, the list could go way on. Um, I just pulled out some that we were really considering. But the, the thing about the, these three components is they can all work together. You could actually have um, some hand-modeled existing conditions, um, and then have part of your model that was procedurally modeled that you, you can bring in and, and show um, you know, hypothetical infill stuff with that. Um, you could have part of it be pictometry, and you could have all these things working together to actually create end results. So um, nothing is exclusive there. 
like I've mentioned several times, uh, the facade imagery or the, the building imagery was just a really important component for us. And so uh, I'm just going to go into that process a little bit more in depth. Uh, this is like one of the, a representative image of kind of what we would get um, and kind of show you how we did that. So first of all, with taking imagery of buildings, um, for us, uh, I just actually looked in the folder just so I could um, reference this. I, I looked and we took 2,800 images of building facades for this project. Uh, and that's a lot. That is kind of ridiculous as far as file management and all that stuff. And so taking images and sorting them in a logical way will help out a lot. Um, so what I ended up doing is um, I'm kind of an ADD person and so Starting out, I would like take a picture of a building facade and then like look across the stream and be like, oh yeah, I really need to model that one soon. And I would like go over there and like take that picture. And the first couple imports were just totally messy, like different building facades next to other ones in my files and file system and it didn't work out that well. And so what I started to do is get disciplined and take, make sure I took all of the pictures of a single building before moving on to the next and I would do all of the images in a block before moving off that block. And so what that does is when you import your photos, I imported them into Lightroom. Uh, it's an Adobe product, great, great program. Uh, when you import those photos like that, then when you go to model a single building, all of the images for that building are just right in line right there. You can find them um, easier um, and it works out well. So. Again, with that whole um, going out and taking the, the, the photos, it's important to try to take uh, photos of every single facade, at least every single one that is important. And I'm using facade, basically a building face that we're just like uh, a face of a building. Um, so some buildings are very simple. They're squares. Some are even triangles. Um, they don't go, go lower than tri triangles. But um, some buildings are super complex. and so. Uh, it's this whole situation where it's like, okay, so do I try to take every single image here? I don't even have all the arrows that I should. Um, or, or can I kind of um, maybe uh, fudge it a little bit and use some generic uh, textures or maybe repeat, maybe this is a similar um, treatment over here with uh, the way the windows are. And so you need to kind of strike that balance and it gets back to the accuracy component of how many, how many pictures are you taking of each building, um, how are they actually um, painting the picture of, of what that building looks like in real life. And so uh, take as many images as you need to. We took a whole lot. Um, I would say err on the side of taking more than less. You can always delete them later. Just take them at an angle so you don't get the bow. Yeah, so the bow, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to the bow. You don't want the bow. So a couple little tips and things just along um, those lines. This is just another kind of, this is an image before it's corrected and I'll, I'll touch on that uh, just briefly. But so I would always use, a, you know, shooting first of all in the dead of winter so there's not leaves on the trees. Um, I said this yesterday, my like number one tip for all of this is if you're in a cold environment where the mittens, where it's like a hybrid, where it's like the cut off fingers and then the mitten folds back. Um, I couldn't have done that without those mittens, so that was huge. Um, but so I'm shooting in December right now. It's probably really cold outside. Um, shooting all day long, and so the sun's at different positions. Sometimes it's right, um, like coming in past the buildings. So just be aware of that. So I use my clipboard to block the sun. This is just a little unwanted detail. So this is just um, inherent in our process. I'm shooting with a camera on the ground, just like this, and so. I got detail in all my images of, you know, if there's something that's an overhang or something like that, that's detail that then gets pasted on the buildings and is in the model, but it's not exactly what you want. So you just need to think about um, trade-offs with your process with things like that. So that's a pretty small example, something like that. No one's ever going to actually like, you know, criticize the building that you've, you've modeled because of something like that. But there are some examples where it gets larger. If you have a cantilever building or something, it gets a little bit more complicated. So um, just think about that stuff. Here's clutter in the foreground. Definitely don't have anything against handicapped parking. Um, but what happens here is you have um, 
a sign that is much closer in the foreground uh, than the actual building I itself. And so you all know what perspective is, and so an object uh, in the foreground appears larger. And so what happens is when you bring this into your model or into Photoshop to edit it, uh, that sign's going to look really big. And so again, that's one of those other just, it's just a trade off of the process, not a big deal. Um, but you, just recognizing that uh, beforehand is important. So if you really wanted to, if you're doing a small um, study site and you really want that accuracy in it to be as crisp as possible, you can go into Photoshop and maybe cut out this window and put it there and like maybe use a little smart fill or stamp or something to, to actually totally edit that sign out. Um, we didn't do that just because the sheer number of uh, structures and buildings we were uh, modeling. Sometimes you're going to have stuff actually preventing um, the correct angle, that perpendicular angle for the photo. Uh, so you just need to be aware of that. Uh, obviously, this one, again, not a big deal. You can't even really tell. But technically, it would be over just a little bit more, but just couldn't get there for the image. So Then the last thing is expose your images for the building face that you're actually taking a picture of, uh, something that I think uh, is a common mistake is people go out there and they've got this SLR camera and maybe they don't use it that much or maybe they just um, it always just works on auto for them and the issue with that is a camera is trying to expose an image so it's trying to make all the light the light sources the light and dark look relatively normal like kind of like a human eye would make it look and so the issue a lot of times, especially if you have something like the sun coming in uh, from the side, is it's going to try to make that sun kind of exposed and the building kind of um, exposed correctly with the, the dark and light values. And a lot of times you'll get a really dark value on the, the building, so it, it looks kind of murky. And so just make sure that um, it's something you can write it down. I'm not going to get into right now, um, but look up exposure compensation and use exposure compensation to correctly expose the face of the building. Um, that's all you care about. None of the scenery or things around it matter, so just don't worry about exposing them at all. Getting to your comment, the way we actually um, got really high quality uh, images uh, was by renting a tilt shift lens. This is the particular lens. We rented it, for, it was just an online rental company. Um, it cost us about 250 bucks for it was like 10 days or something like that. Um, it's usually, I think, it's over a $2,000 lens. Uh, so very expensive if you're actually going to uh, purchase one. So go ahead and rent it, take all your photos and return it. Um, so it's very wide angle. You can see it's got this kind of domed glass piece. It's 17 millimeters if you know focal length. So it's, it's very wide and why that's important is you can be closer to a building face that you're taking a picture of, so there's less of that foreground clutter that we talked about. Um, and you know, if you're in an alley or something, you can actually sometimes still get that whole building face. So 17 millimeter lens, it's a tilt shift lens. So what that means, there's actually these knobs on it, and you, you adjust the knobs. And what that does is it actually changes the perspective that is like basically um, the way it's viewing the scene. And so the way I like to think about this is if you're looking up at a skyscraper or a very tall building, what's going to happen? You're on the ground, you're looking up. It recedes into, it kind of narrows at the top. And that's basically like a vanishing point with your perspective. Um, and so you don't want that. That's, that's, that's not what you want because you're, you're pasting this on just um, a building face and you want to be able to pan around and view at any perspective. And so what this lens does is it actually, you know, you would be looking up at this um, vanishing point. This lens can actually bring it out so, so it becomes straight again. So you're able to correct those, um, uh, uh, any perspective change. The other thing it does is it doesn't distort the way a normal wide angle lens would do. And so um, I personally have, um, for my camera, a 24 millimeter lens, which is also pretty wide angle. Um, I had to do some supplementary shooting with that, and the big problem with that is it actually bows, it distorts parts of the image, and that's a huge problem because that's like that's actually one of the cha most challenging things to correct in Photoshop later on. Uh, 
you almost there's like tools like puppet warp that you could potentially try to like um, get this straight line with but essentially what's going to happen is um, you're putting uh, you know this this image on a square plane in SketchUp and so you'll probably just end up lopping off some of that coriness in that image so it just doesn't look quite as good so um, that really worked well um, for us. I definitely recommend if you have the resources to rent this lens. Uh, it's really good. You obviously need a camera body to put it on. Um, but so the workflow for modeling, again, I kind of wanted to keep this presentation at like, you know, the 800 foot level looking down. I want to just jump into this, just the process that we use because it is very simple, actually. Um, there's other ways to do it. I'm not going to cover everything about this, but there's like probably 45 tutorials online that get into this. So just you can look up how to photo model a building. There's things like photo match you can use. We didn't do that. Um, but this is just kind of our, our process here. Um, again, I talked about how this was essentially orthographically correct imagery. So it's, it's accurate, not distorted imagery. Um, you can see that due, due to the way that the image was taken that you do have these building faces so it's kind of um, skewed a little bit so I'll show you how we correct for that but so basically we just started by tracing that outline of the building popping it up and then putting the texture that is on the base your aerial image on the roof and you use that with the bucket tool and you use the like eyedropper bucket um, a little command for a, on a uh, PC, it's hitting Alt when you have the paint bucket tool in SketchUp. And so you hit Alt and you just click on this texture and then hit the paint bucket tool and apply it to the roof. And what it does is it applies that same aerial image to the roof. The problem with that is it's, it's applied. If I just did that in SketchUp, you see only this part because it's clipped down to the size, but you've actually brought up the entire aerial image and put it on the roof. So what you want to do, and I'm not going to get in exactly like how you do this, the SketchUp to Photoshop um, interaction, but what you need to do is basically right click on that. It's edit image in Photoshop, um, go into Photoshop and crop that image down to just the roof that you need. So you're eliminating all that extra data that you're not even viewing. You can use, you make any texture. Yeah, you use that, it crops it and you can use the file size so it can make it a little... Make unique texture? Yeah. Yeah, it would be doing that. Can you crop it in? It cropped it Oh, nice. Okay, so you can do that. Apparently, I didn't even do this. Um, yeah, oh, maybe I did. You know, that might actually, I think we experienced that and that's why we did the workflow. This is like months ago. Um, anyways, just look up a process that works for you on how to, to actually work with those, those textures. One thing um, to note with this is you can see here that this actually looks like a pretty high resolution image. What SketchUp does, SketchUp is uh, a vector-based program and that basically means mathematical lines. You can zoom in them to an infinite amount. Um, 3D models are vector. This imagery is raster, so it's little pixels. Um, what SketchUp does is called downsampling if you just bring in a raster image. And so there's a setting that's called OpenGL in the preferences. And if you uncheck the constrained maximum texture size, basically it'll display it as a high resolution texture instead of downsampling, which will make it look fuzzy. So, so anyway, so we've got our roof on. Right now, we're ready to just keep on going with our modeling process. I apply the photo textures. Again, not going to get into exactly how to do that, but these are the images from the building. I apply them. I actually have roof detail in here now. Um, I do this, it's not really correct. I do roof detail at the very end, but it is important to note that if you're going to be looking at stuff ever from above, Buildings look a lot more convincing. They kind of pop. They look a little bit more realistic if you just put in um, some random building texture. So what I do is just um, offset the outside profile by eight inches or a foot, um, drop it down a little bit so you have a little lip around the roof, and then I just extrude basically some random HVAC stuff based on the aerial. That's not accurate. It's just kind of visual fluff. So the other thing that I, I mentioned, we went to this painstaking effort to take this high quality, non-distorted imagery. 
what that did was it gave me the confidence to actually use that imagery to do the massing. And so I basically, once that image is on there, um, I just drop those lines down for those insets and push them in using kind of looking at Google Earth for that reference. But um, I, I just break up the massing based on those photo textures there. So you're, you're doing the articulations of the building right off the textures. And then I just move the building over to where it would actually be placed. Um, I, you know, we talked about how it looked a little bit skewed just because that aerial image. You just slide the building over. This gets back to that tip I talked about earlier about saving your buildings out. Um, I actually back up at this stage right here. Actually, sorry, this stage right here. Um, what I do is I make I triple click, click on the building itself, make it a component, and then I save it out as its own SketchUp file. And so what's actually happening with my workflow in that process is um, I didn't show it here today, but um, I do save it out and then I actually edit and do everything for the rest of these steps in, in like its own SketchUp file. And then in the master file I have, it still just looks like this as a component. You just right click on that again, you hit reload and like it's like poof, it like just magically pops up with the, the final building. And so that's great. It's a more efficient file structure and it also uh, allows you to go into buildings individually as their own SketchUp files and manipulate them or do whatever you want with them um, without even touching the master file. I know that's complicated. Again, there are tutorials on it. So just one more time, this is what that complete model looked like. So actually the building that we were looking at is right there. Um, and of course it's, it's part of this overall giant model. You can see actually in, in, in this view here, there's, um, it's hard to see at this level, but there's all this vegetation in here. Um, there's even automobiles and things like that. And so our process didn't end with SketchUp. We went ahead and put this um, model in a rendering program called Lumion. For us, this was a game changer. Um, the big components of this uh, are, first of all, um, it runs differently than most programs on a computer. Most programs, even SketchUp included, run off your processor. That's called your CPU. Um, and so there, it's inherently hard to pan and manipulate 3D graphics um, or just graphic intensive stuff on your processor. That stuff's much better suited for your graphics card. And you're thinking, well, I'm in SketchUp, I use a graphics card and it makes it better. That's true, it does, but the primary um, way the program is running is on your processor. With Lumion, it's actually running really pretty much completely off your graphics card. That's huge. It makes a really, really big difference for being able to pan around and actually interact with a really large file. So our total model, our complete model in SketchUp, it freezes, it's slow. If you turn it on and off layers, it takes a long time. None of those problems exist in Lumion. So it's this seamless, buttery, nice, pleasing experience to work around it. Um, so that was really important. For rendering out scenes, um, my background, I did a lot of like 3ds Max, like all this like other modeling. Um, rendering can take a really long time in most programs. In Lumion, it takes almost no time. They've got this really high quality library of 3D components. You can do walkthroughs and video output with it. It's super powerful, but it kind of, no offense to Lumion, it kind of looks like it was like designed for like a third grader to use. Um, there's like star icons and like little guys with shovels and stuff. So, so the learning curve for Lumion is, it's a couple days and you kind of have most of the, the main components of it. So it's pretty user friendly. Same kind of stuff as uh, SketchUp down here. This is like its rendering window. You've got scenes so you can, you know, go back to different scenes. These are your four uh, sizes that you're constrained to. And I can say constrained. Um, they're really broad down to like a really small render up to a very large one. Over here, just focusing in, this is a sun study. So we use Lumion for uh, sun analysis and it's just as accurate as any other program as far as doing that type of analysis. You've got your longitude, latitude, 
daylight savings time, day, month, year. It gets down to minute, which is just ridiculous, but um, it's nice to have that power. Uh, another huge thing, and almost all programs uh, have this feature. Um, I just wanted to touch on it specifically because it's near and dear to my heart, and that is focal length. I talked about it a little bit earlier with taking those images. Uh, focal length is super, it's uh, just, uh, it's so important for all of this work. Um, basically the two components with focal length, and so basically focal length is if you have a camera, everyone like put your little camera up, and you like zoom in with a camera, you're changing the focal length, okay? What happens with that is two things. It's called distortion or compression. Okay, so this is an example of distortion. And so I've dropped this down all the way for Lumion. The minimum focal length is 10 millimeters. I know it sounds like an arbitrary number. If you start looking into this, it'll make sense. 10 millimeters. I just took this, the, the, this image here. That's probably like 60, 70 feet away from that building. It looks like it's hundreds of feet, feet away. So what that focal length is doing is it's distorting the foreground. So it's making that foreground look bigger than it actually is. And what that does is it actually misconstrues the way something looks. And so um, we've actually seen it uh, in our office some where um, different developers or architects will come in with this like beautiful, gorgeous rendering that just looks like the most amazing building you've ever seen. And one of the tricks that they use to make it look that good is manipulating the focal length so, so it doesn't look as big or daunting um, as the buildings around it. The other thing that, uh, the inverse side of that, so if you zoom in a lot, so you have um, uh, like a very high number for your focal length, you get what's called compression, and that's the exact opposite effect of distortion, and that's where things look very similar. They look closer together. They look like they're a similar scale, and so, um, being able to adjust the focal length with renderings is just crucial. Um, we settled on about 43 millimeter focal length to get as close to the human eye as we could. Some people will say 50, some people will say 30. There's different schools of thought on that. The 50 eliminates any distortion whatsoever, but it's a narrower lens than the human eye. The 30 is almost more what we see. The thing is, is we human eyes are just like one of the most sophisticated tools ever invented and it actually has a curved back, the back of your eye that perceives is curved. Rendering programs and uh, cameras alike have not been able to actually um, like get to that level of technology where it's that precise. So that's why we settled on that number. I know it's kind of in-depth, it's kind of specific, but for us it was that 43 millimeters um, for rendering things out uh, as correctly as possible. Any questions with that stuff? I know it's, it gets a little heady. Okay, so we're gonna move on now to actually using the model that you have uh, spent so many hours creating. So this is where it gets a little bit more fun. And again, um, just really wanna stress for uh, us as a municipality and for um, other people, if you make a model like this, it should not sit on the shelf collecting dust, the little digital shelf. Um, use it for as many things as possible, get creative with it. Um, just go through a couple things for us. Um, the primary thing, I talked about that downtown plan that we were creating, it's a long range plan. Uh, we use the model a lot for outreach. So this particular activity right here, um, that's a big rendering of the model. We could have even gone bigger. Um, so you can do these huge blow ups of it. And we were asking people to um, place where they thought larger buildings would be appropriate in the downtown area. So you're able to have someone be able to uh, visually interact and give us input uh, with the model. Um, we used it for large scale events to just highlight, um, you know, key ideas or illustrate concepts. And then things like design charrettes, this became very important. Um, so this is basically um, a blow up and a large printout of a section of the model there. People are able to interact with it. Um, we would have trace paper over it. Um, and so basically people are giving us their visions, their ideas, what they thought um, would be appropriate in these different areas of our downtown. Um, so what this actually, this exercise, this design charrette, um, and a couple other um, events we had turned into um, 
kind of a, a, a summary of some of the biggest ideas we had for these areas. We were able to then use the, the model to um, illustrate these concepts. Uh, so again, this is just a rendering of the model. Um, I did go into Photoshop and kind of mask out um, the areas that we weren't focused on. So you're able to just kind of, um, you know, get creative with the, your presentations of it. And basically around, I know it's very hard to read, but uh, around the edge in these boxes are kind of action items or things that are proposed for those areas uh, of town. So powerful stuff there. Another visualization that we did, this is the same model. Um, it was one of those save as situations where I just saved a version of, of our master model, stripped away all the textures. And so it's a little challenging to see, but basically um, all the buildings are the way they are now. And then I just extruded volumes of our maximum height limit over those buildings. And so what that is, is it's illustrating the point about kind of maximum build out for the, the city. So where we are now uh, as a municipality, and what our code would allow uh, developers to build um, in the future here. So it's, it's illustrating the, this idea of infill and growth and redevelopment. We're using it, the model for development review. So we can actually just take a developer or an architect's model, their SketchUp model, drop it in our big model, and then uh, assess the compatibility in the context uh, like I was referring to uh, earlier. So, this is a project that was proposed and actually finally approved. Um, and we were able to do uh, all this in-depth analysis um, using that specific photo, or the focal length to get the accurate kind of perspective of what it would really look like for that ground level user. Um, you can see here these cars, these are from Lumion. The trees are too. The way that uh, I got those trees to be kind of ghosted um, is in Lumion just rendering out two passes of the same scene, one with the layers of, with the trees turned on, one with it turned off, overlay those images in Photoshop, uh, turn down the opacity on the tree layer, and you, you have that image. So pretty, pretty simple there. Um, the reason why we did that is, you know, in Colorado with seasons, sometimes trees have leaves on them, sometimes they don't, and so it's kind of splitting the difference there. It's just another view. You can do, you could use the same thing. You can see this is kind of a dark side uh, of the building there. That's the north facing side. You could very easily run a sun analysis uh, on the impacts of this building, um, all sorts of other stuff. Getting to that sun analysis component, that's what this is. Um, we used a version of the model to basically um, assess our solar inventory for uh, the city. And we were able to just kind of um, paint the picture of uh, how different uh, scales and configurations of buildings uh, affect solar windows uh, for our, the streets and other areas or other buildings in the area. Uh, same thing just, you know, with the uh, versatility, cutting sections. So you're able to cut just massing study sections, photorealistic sections. You can bring those under Photoshop, manipulate them more uh, and get some really interesting visuals out of it. We undertook an effort which I'm calling hypothetical infill modeling. This is where we basically modeled uh, buildings that would meet our code from a, basically a, a size and step back perspective. We went ahead and just took materials from other cities or you know, some of it was from the 3D warehouse, some of it was images I collected. We just pasted these images on as a generic thing uh, and then changed the scale of a building and basically uh, ask the community and stakeholders, you know, um, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about um, uh, the, the scale of a building changing? Uh, and tried to paint the picture of trade-offs, um, uh, you know, like density and things like that, uh, even affordability in housing and commercial stock, uh, and have some, some challenging conversations. Did this on multiple sites, so this is in no way even a proposed project. It's totally hypothetical. Um, but we're able to just kind of analyze how scaling of a building would in fact impact the community at large and just the surrounding area. This whole study, uh, everything we've done with this, uh, it's been very interesting. Um, 
we've got fairly detailed response from people on this. Uh, the challenge with it, though, is the reactions totally range completely across the board from don't build tall buildings, don't build big buildings at all, keep this as a small, quaint prairie town, all the way up to people saying eliminate all restrictions on building height, mass, scale, and let the free market dictate how those buildings are built, and then everything in between. And so currently we don't have this consensus in our community about how things should infill and develop uh, and what the overall kind of um, build out size of the, the city should be. So that's been challenging. And so what we've decided to do is kind of take it down a level. And so we're starting to look at the more intricate components of uh, developing sites. And so what, what this is, it's called a pro forma analysis. And what a pro forma is, is basically all of the numbers and all of the parameters that a developer looks at to see if a project is feasible or not. So this uh, includes things like um, speculative lease rates that they'll be getting for the product, the square footage, the cost of land, the cost of construction, the cost of architects, all of these variables that influence a project, developers look at, usually they have um, either uh, modeling software for that or the, the case that we're using is um, a really intricate Excel file that basically has all these numbers in it um, and it, it lets you know what uh, return rates you have, you've got interest rates and just all of this crazy detail. Um, why we're doing that is we need to be looking at both sides of the table and both sides of the equation with how things get developed. As the city's perspective, you know, we can say, oh, well, we want this form or we want this style or we want this type of material, but that's not necessarily always feasible. It's not something that you can just you know, mandate and the market's gonna you know, magically just provide it. And so we wanna have the most complete understanding possible of what it takes to build a project and that's, that's kind of why we're doing that. We're looking for kind of incentives or magic numbers that we can hit on. I talked about like those step backs before, uh, looking for those crucial numbers to, to actually um, you know, try to get, get the best products possible. So um, we started out just kind of with this process of just kind of modeling the, the largest, like the max size building you could have right now under our land use code. Then we actually started plugging in numbers and getting a little bit more feasible with um, the terms kind of like making it pencil. And that's basically making a project feasible for a developer. There's kind of some baseline standard numbers for that. Um, so these iterations uh, for the site are starting to get closer. The challenge we were having is none of these were actually parking with that new minimum parking requirement that I talked about. And so what we did, we basically put it out to our, our team, our consultant team that was working on this. And it's like, okay, we need um, to make a building that really pencils and um, really parks too. Um, and so what we got was, was these two. Uh, the one on the left here is a residential building with ground floor retail. The other is a commercial building. And what we found is that parking requirement uh, actually restricts what can be developed to such a huge degree that it can really hinder project, pro, uh, projects. Um, an example of this, and this is all new information to me, but um, this is what's called, um, this building here is a double loaded corridor. So you have residential units on either side of, of a hallway. And that is the most efficient way in this day and age to build residential multifamily units is a double loaded corridor. With a double loaded corridor, pretty much the minimum dimensions you can have for that total building become 60 feet. If you go under that 60 feet for the dimension of that building, so how, how deep it is there, uh, you get really weird layouts for that space inside and it's just not something that people want to live in a market. It's like this kind of long, awkward, uh, configuration for the apartments inside. And so what happened was to get parking and to have everything work out, that building 62 feet. So that means we have two feet basically to manipulate the building form, to do those step backs, to get articulation and make it a more interesting building and still pencil. And so we found that it's just very, uh, it's very constrained if you have something like that parking minimum. And so we're re-examining that right now. We'll probably go um, and pitch it to city council to, to change that. Um, we'll see what that process actually ends up looking like. Um, but basically we, we're recommending that 
just like the old system let the free market dictate how a project is parked. Um, Isn't there like, uh, uh, as soon as the parking starts to like be cramped, that the developers will start to go to indoor parking? Yeah, so actually that's a great question. The question is about um, making a, a switch over to more of like a structured parking. We did a bunch of analysis on that. There's things um, like this example, it's called even tuck under parking right here where it's just surface level parking but the building's built over it. We looked at stuff like that. We looked at um, structured parking, so multiple levels. The thing is, is if you get into things like structured parking, in our market right now, it's about $30,000 a space to build structured parking. So, um, you know, the affordability of a project, even just the feasibility of a project um, escalates a lot. And that's particularly true on these smaller infill sites like this one we've modeled here. Um, and in a lot of these sites, you don't even have the room to have the ramping and stuff required for that parking. And so um, what we're proposing is still structured parking, but um, if developers could do like a fee in lieu, so instead of providing parking on site, they pay the city some to then build a parking structure on a larger piece of land and have more of it be a, be a common element. Um, so that's where we are right now. There's um, a lot of other analysis we're doing with this. We're actually just now starting to model a larger site that would actually have um, a parking garage on it that would be a public-private partnership. Um, and we're going to see what the numbers um, give us that. But hopefully all of this helps us then finish the downtown plan, write new code language that helps out the community and the way buildings are built and still makes it feasible for developers to actually come in and, and make a product. Um, just one last slide here is that same site. Once we finish this pro forma analysis, we'll do something here like you know, applying materials and stuff like that and gain public reaction and input on, on things like facade treatment and materials. So um, with that, are there any questions? Yes. All right, covered it all. Thank you all. Appreciate it.